right, all set. Oh, I didn't see the little notification. That's probably that. Yes, it is. There it is. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to National Distance Learning Week. I'm Alexandra Pickett. I'm the Director of Online Teaching at SUNY Online. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today. I've known Dave for um, a very long time. In fact, he used to work for SUNY Online many moons ago in one of his, uh, in one of his um, identities as an instructional designer. Um, Dave Gadu is an assistant professor today in computing sciences, in the computing sciences department at Finger Lakes Community College. And he has numerous years in online education as an instructor, and as I mentioned, as an instructional designer. Um, he also spent time in his early career as a high school math teacher. And he is definitely known for his ability to innovate and to find solutions for his colleagues and to improve the design and delivery of their courses. We are in for an extraordinary treat. I'm so excited to welcome you, Dave. Take it away. Oh, well, thank you so much. And uh, you actually uh, recruited both Aaron and I to SUNY, and we had a very fruitful career there. And we were there actually right when Oscar was getting started, but it was a really wonderful time to be. It's always a wonderful time to be at SUNY, but thank you for um, for saying all those nice things. Um, and so maybe we can just go around the uh, once again and just say who you are. And maybe I'll just call you because I, I have an order and just say like who you are, where you're from, and what you do there. And Loy, uh, you are first on the uh, little boxes that go across the top of the screen. Oh boy, I'm number one. <laughs> um, so I'm Loy Gross, I'm an online learning specialist at GCC and I'm also admin faculty. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, and then, so next is Casey. Hi, I'm Casey Ryan. I am an assistant professor of criminal justice at Hudson Valley Community College and a faculty mentor for Brightspace. Um, and I'm also an adjunct in CJ at Empire State in Delhi and an adjunct at Monroe um, in sociology. Oh, wow. You're busy. That's awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing. And then uh, Ifioma, I think you're next. And if you don't have a microphone, you can just uh, type into the box. So I guess we'll go to the next person, which is Ron. Hi, I'm Ron. And I'm an instructional designer in the Center for Online Learning at Alfred State College. And I have done uh, adjuncting work in geology and uh, technical writing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And I think that's everyone. Did I miss anyone? Okay. Super. Well, I guess we'll uh, just get right into it and I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm doing this, so, and, and I mentioned this uh, at the part one on Monday. And by the way, if, um, if you're here for part two today and you weren't here for part one Monday, Aaron did put the link into the chat. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, we'll do a brief uh, recap of that in 45 seconds or less, or 45 seconds or fewer, I'm sorry fewer than 45 seconds. And I'm also putting a link in the chat for the software that I'm going to be demoing. Um, so at any rate, on Monday, I was uh, talking about a study that actually Alexander Pickett had sent me. I emailed her and I was like, hey, do you know of any studies that, you know, speak to like good course design and efficacy and how, um, how that affects student perceptions? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, 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 the results of the study were like, not only like our students grades better, but they also, if you have a poorly designed class, specifically with findability, so learners ability to like find the content and find the assignments, uh, you get ranked not only as a lower professor, but also as someone who's unqualified to be teaching the class. Is, is that a good su summarization of that? Yeah, that's one of the one of their findings, the perceptions in terms of findability. Uh, they did eye tracking um, study. And um, so for the students who had difficulty 
finding, and we're talking about like seconds, right? Um, if your information of your online course is buried in your syllabus and your syllabus is buried in a link and the link is buried in the course somewhere, that affects findability. And if they can't find the bit of information that they're looking for, like how to contact you, how they're gonna be evaluated, what the books are, whatever, if they can't find that quickly, their perception of the quality of the course diminishes. The part that blew my mind was their perception of the qualifications of the instructor to teach the course affects their satisfaction and um, so uh, and goes down. So it blew my mind when I saw that. Findability is important. Yeah, it's pretty bonkers. Um, and and that, that actually, I think you sent that study to me right around the time we were transitioning to Brightspace. So I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity to kind of uh, make sure that I'm doing a better job with discoverability and findability. So uh, we had talked on Monday about this software. You can find it at md.learnbrightspace.com. The link is in the chat. And the MD stands for Markdown. And we talked about how Markdown is a fairly common uh, concept across many platforms, Brightspace, Outlook, for example. Um, but also um, in, in Google Docs, you can use it as you're actually constructing documents. Also, it's the only way to format text within a comment. So you can impress all your friends that way. And then we talked about specific specific uh, markdown. So in this case, let's say we're doing something again, like we're doing geometry. And this is called the jumbotron, where you type it as carrot, carrot, and it gets put into a big bar. And one of the reasons I like doing this is because if you get into a course and you have some subfolder, for, for instance, uh, so let's see, we have some subfolders in this chapter right here. When you have subfolders, it's an easy way for the learners to kind of see where like things break up just with that jumbotron. So knowing the, the markdown and again, the paradigm that I use is I keep all, all the work that I will type in this little box in a text file, actually in multiple text files, and then just copy and paste the HTML into Brightspace. So then if I need to make a change to the content down the road, I'll just bring up this text file, make the change copy the HTML and paste it into Brightspace. And I'll show you what that workflow looks like in a minute. But I did just want to go over the, the very quick ones that we went over um, on Monday where we used one hashtag for heading one. And we could say like, oh, this is triangles. Um, and then maybe we have some text about what triangles are. You know, it's 180 degrees, uh, three side figure. And then you can use two hashtags for heading two. So this might be isosceles. And then uh, even three, you could have like, an acute isosceles. And the headings are great for a few different reasons. Um, not only do you get text decoration, but you get text hierarchy, which is great for accessibility and screen readers. So, uh, and this is true, I would always use this in Microsoft Word or Google Docs, as well I'll use the styles where it's like heading one, heading two, heading three, for the same reason. Um, we also talked about bulleted lists. So if you, uh, for instance, had types of triangles and you want to do a bulleted list, you could just do an asterisk. And you could say like uh, obtuse, ooh, I spelled that wrong. Um, uh, a Q and maybe right. So that's an easy way to do bulleted lists. Uh, and you'll, you'll recall, especially from Blackboard, if you try doing bulleted lists, uh, you get some really wonky results. Um, but you can do the same thing with numbered lists as well. You just replace the bullets with numbers and it will automatically number for you. And the nice thing about that is if you type the wrong number, then it still will keep the proper number when it renders that markdown. Um, one, some of the other things that we talked about in on Monday were you could you can bold text with two different with two asterisks if you bookend it. And you can do emphasis or italics uh, if you just bookend it with one um, asterisk. And these are all very generic, very common markdown that work across many, many different platforms. With the exception of this Jumbotron, anytime you see a carrot, that's specific to the software that we made in the department. And when I say we made it in the department, it was not me. It was uh, Aaron Sullivan. And he's uh, he's in charge of our video game design program. And he was just sick of dealing with the key or the text input in bright in uh, Blackboard. And then I laid on this quick guide that goes over it. So if you're using this for the first time, you're like, oh, Dave went over how to do like italics. It's kind of like a quick little thing. And so you can see like, oh, this is awesome. And it will give you an example of that. Or if you want to do monospace, you'll do that back tick. Um, 
or if you want to do, oh, we didn't do links. We'll have to do links. Or if you want to do that Jumbotron, for instance, um, I give you the code for how to do the Jumbotron. So um, this quick guide is kind of like a, a quick little way to access your content when you're done or your, uh, I guess, like the guide, the, the instructions. When you are done, I recommend you copy the HTML and then you go into Brightspace wherever you want that content to live. And I'll just put it here in, in the sandbox course. Um, we have a folder for National Distance Learning Week. And in this folder, I'm just going to create an, uh, a file, a web page. And you might recall that in the past, you say an HTML page, but they changed the uh, vernacular on that. And it's really critically important that you remember to paste it in the source code. If you don't see that source code button, it might be because your overflow menu is not engaged. And this is, a, this is a sticky menu, so it will persist. Once you reveal it here, it will always be revealed. Uh, you just, I wipe out everything that's in there and I paste in exactly what the code was. And, you know, I give it a title. So this is just like basic markdown example and hit save. And when you hit save, it will um, render exactly as you'd expect it to be rendered. So the the other piece of the puzzle is well, what do you do with this text because if you just delete all this text it's like ephemeral and and if you want to make changes to here sure you can go into edit the html in here but um you know sometimes if your cursor is on the wrong line you get kind of like weird artifacting so what i suggest you do is save all of these as text files so i would just open up a text editor paste it save this and then retrieve it later and you can save it in google docs uh i think what I use is GitHub and GitHub is meant for software in general, but I just use it to store all my text files. So for instance, this is my entire FYE course and all it is is text files um, that go, uh, so let's see, uh, I'll do this um, course outline. This is just a markdown file and I just copy it and then I'll bring it over here, wipe out the text, put it in here. And then this, then I'll make, you know, make my changes here and copy and paste this into Brightspace and then um, make sure that like I update the text here. So that's my thing is I always want my source of truth to be text files and markdown. Um, I don't want my source of truth to be what's in the course because formatting can still get a little bit wonky. So that was kind of a summary of what happened Monday. Are there any questions before we go into the like really, uh, uh, what I think is like the, the second level higher, like way to potentiate the course design. Any questions? I don't see any so far. Feel free awesome. to type in the chat if you have some and I'll be happy to interrupt Dave. Yes, please do, please, please, please interrupt me. So uh, I have, it, what what I wanted to show you today is like you, there's an awful lot to do here. Um, and I want to show you kind of some examples of ways that we are using them, or at least that I use them in my classes. And um, but the the amount of tools that you have here is going to exceed the amount of time we have today. So I'm not going to go over every, every one of these. But once you see me start to do two or three or four of these, the the pattern is is the same. You just go down to uh, the copy thing, and you know you can see the text right here. That's the actual markdown. You can come back up here and paste it in and it will have the text for you. And then you can just, you know, modify this text however you want. So uh, the, the first thing that I think is actually really important is columns. Columns tend to be um, a better way. I think if you have lots of text in, in, in a page in Brightspace, columns are break up the text to, you know, kind of like chunk it up visually and you get a little bit more white space. So for instance, um, in, in here, we have, you can see there's text on the left-hand side, and then I happen to put a YouTube video on the right-hand side, but it very easily could have been other text. And then I use, you know, there's a heading right there, and this is how I have the learner submit their work. They click here. So there's actually three things, four things going on. We have the Jumbotron. We have text here on the left. We have a YouTube video on the right which we went over on Monday, but I'll kind of recreate this. We have a heading here, and then this is called a call out box. And you can change this, this particular icon to be like a downloaded file or like a college or a book or a university. There's all sorts of different icons that you can use. So let me show you how to make some columns first. 
Uh, and for this, I'm going to need a paragraph of lorem ipsum. There we go. So let's say that you wanted to have, I don't know, some kind of reading of some topic. And you normally have like a whole bunch of text. It can get kind of kind of cumbersome. So instead, what I'd suggest you do as an option is you can use, and here's what the, the special symbol is. And again, if you want that special symbol, you can hit this quick guide and go to columns and lists. And you could just go to two columns. You can get the commands here. You can read it. You could actually copy the code here. Um, but I'm just going to build it from scratch. And the way that we do it is, again, anything that's custom for this FLCC software starts with a caret. So that's how you know it's custom. And anything that's not custom is a typical markdown. And then we were like, it would be cute if like this represented kind of like two columns of text. So that's what we use. And you can put a paragraph or two or three paragraphs in there, however much you want. And you can see it's only taking up the left-hand side. And then we have a divider, which is a caret with three equal signs. And then you can have some text. And then to end this whole column business, we just use a caret with one equal sign. And then you can, you know, keep on typing in general. And so you so here's what it looks like right here. So we have two col two columns, one on the left, one on the right. And maybe want a YouTube video like I had on the right hand side. So I've queued up a video right here. Uh, this is um, by the way, if you if if you want to do any research on sleep, um, this is Dr. Matthew Walker. He's been on all sorts of interviews and podcasts. Uh, he wrote a book called Why Do We Sleep? And it's like every every sentence that you read, you're like, holy crap, I'm doing it wrong. I, I really need more sleep than I think I do. Um, so at any rate, I want to embed that video and I kind of want it to be where this text is. I want that video to be on the right hand side. So we use the YouTube tag, which again, starts with a carrot. So that's custom made. And you have to go to share embed and just grab this code with the copy button and just paste that in there. And so now we have a right hand column that has the video and I might do some work. I'm like, oh, this, this can actually go underneath because we have kind of enough space. Um, so I'll just do that. Uh, and then you can kind of like adjust the columns however you want it. There's of course other ways to accomplish this, but one of the nice things about having structure in, and that, that would include like columns is that it collapses. So if you're on say a mo, if your learner's on a mobile device, it will collapse properly. Um, as opposed to if you kind of like, like jerry rig it, then it might not read properly when you're on a smaller device. So again, if you're doing columns, and I'll do it this way now. You just go to the quick link and you find columns and lists. And you're like, oh, yeah, I definitely want the, the two columns. Click on the two columns and hit the copy button. And then just paste. Uh, and this will set up right up for you. And you can add whatever text you want. And you'll note that this is the same exact thing I did where we had caret, two columns. Then we had kind of the line or the divider and then kind of end the, 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 get the container for the two columns. So... That's how you can do two columns. Uh, it works great, especially if you have like walkthrough videos that you want to be in your content or something like that. Um, okay. no, th yes. Accessibility question. We touched yeah. on this a little bit in the first one with some of the other um, formatting that you showed us, but mm -hmm. um, is are these columns accessible? Do they work with screen readers? And also Alex is clarifying, it's not a table then, right? It's a column or Correct. you are using that for creating tables also. No, we do. Oh, we do have separate. tables. Okay. Yeah, we do have tables that, and as far as I know, these are accessible. Columns should just be by uh, yeah. by nature um, accessible because there's there's nothing special about those tags. Um, but you, you'll actually see like um, the fact that we have tables with captions, and we make the way that you make a table, you have to have the headings in there anyhow. And those are the two biggest things for accessibility. Right. Um, our captions and the headers, and they're built in, and, and also when you look at the media, which we'll do a little bit later today, when you're doing images, it has the alt description is built right into it as well. So we try to be as to keep be accessibility forward in, in the design principles for this particular software. 
that good questions. I'm glad that there's people keeping an eye on accessibility. All right. The next thing that I want to show you is um, I want to show you, and we talked about this before about when you're creating content, you can, Brightspace has those templates built in. Uh, we talked about this on Monday where you can do like the accordions or you can do tabs, but you can't really do both unless you are comfortable manipulating HTML. So I want to show you kind of like, this is actually a reason why we do need to have both in this particular case. This is a fairly complex assignment, um, a fairly complex lab. So we wanted to make sure that we had the steps and it was broken down, and but we didn't want it to be too overwhelming. So we wanted the learners to be able to kind of like go through this and expand it at, when they wanted. But then we also wanted to have on the same page a whole bunch of resources so that if learners were doing, say, images and media in this particular software, there's some video walkthroughs for there. If they were learning how to do variables, we can have it there. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop. Um, and then again, at the end, we'll we'll have the specifications, and then this is where you this in this um, call-out box is where you go to submit your work. So I'm going to show you the how what well, I think it is easy to do the the tabs and the accordion. So we have um, a heading for that right here, and I'm just going to pick an accordion. and paste it in. And it, it, it will always be expanded when you're in this developing phase, but then when you paste this into Brightspace, and I'll show you this, it will, will not be. Um, so the structure for this is we have to say that the accordion is starting. And then at the bottom, we have to say, oh yeah, and the accordion's ending as well. And then in between is just like, this is your first line of text. So it would be step one in this particular case. So this actually has four different sections to it. Step one, two, three, four. So this is how you delineate your first item. And then you can have any text you want. In fact, you can put images, you can put YouTube videos in here as well. You can put any content you want in there. And then when you're ready for a second collapsible box, you prepend it with the three carrots. Again, that's your second item. So right now we have three. If we needed a fourth one, you just add it in there. And I'll, I'll say like, yeah, another item. And I'll just put, you know, whatever text we have. So. This gives us an accordion. I'm gonna copy the HTML and bring it back down here and I'm gonna wipe out this markdown example here. Actually, maybe I'll just add it to it so you can kind of see. Um, actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to save that and then hit save and close. And now we have um, the, the different items that you can expand and you can see that we actually hit, uh, have four of them. Um, oh, I did something wrong. Oh, goodness. This is super embarrassing. I, I have noticed, and th this is, this is going to sound like an excuse, and I guess it, it, it is an excuse, um, that, okay, there it goes. Brightspace changed something, as did Google. Um, and so we've had to go back and kind of modify the code, but I think I just must not have copied everything when I pasted it in. Um, but this is what it should look like. This is what you would expect an accordion to look like. And we've tried to keep up on, um, the changes and it's, it's few and far between when that happens, but we, we fix it once we observe that it's happened. So there isn't an issue. I just copy and pasted wrong. I guess they, I hope you didn't pay too much for this webinar. Um, but now the question is like, well, that's great. But what if I also want to have like that tab browser? And one of the nice, one of the other examples why you might want to have um, a tabbed, like tabs is if I teach this class both in person and online. And because it's an online class, I have a video of the slideshow. But when it's in person, I like to do the slideshow. So I always keep this, this is my in-person class. And I can like, you know, kind of quickly reference the slideshow here and, and play it. But if a learner's absent that day, then there's a video in there that I already give my online learners anyhow. So I like to have, this is an example of why you might want to have tabs. Um, or in this particular case down here, you might want to have, you know, several tabs for different resources. So to do tabs, again, like you just go to the quick uh, guide and you click on tabs. And you're like, okay, well, you could like read through here or just look at this code and kind of understand the structure. But I, I think it's just as easy to copy it. And maybe we'll just for the sake of space, I'm going to move everything down there and I'm going to paste the tabs up here. 
So now in this case, the structure is you still have to have the tabs like where it starts and then you still have to have the tabs end, but you have to reference what the, the tabs are going to be going across the top. So AAA, BBB, CCC, and then you would have like each tab would start. So this would be the tab for the text that goes with BBB and then another tab that goes with CCC. So in our live example over here, we'd have to say like tutorial, comma, navigation, comma, images and media, variables and prompts. And that would go across the top here. And then whatever text you want to go with the first one you put in this first chunk. So if we wanted to add another one, all we have to do is add another tab and have whatever text we want. And again, like it's going to be expanded and reveal them all. This is just for development purposes so that you can see it. But when you're ready, you just copy it, come back over here. Ooh, that's not where I want to put it. That would be bad. It's a live course. And we'll go to edit and I'm just going to wipe out the HTML that we have here and just paste in the new stuff and hit save and close. Let's see if I copy and pasted right this time. I did. So now you have B, C, and we have that fourth one that is added as well as an accordion. And by the way, if you wanted to get tricky, I think this will, I think this will work. This might be bonkers. Maybe instead of this text to go with BBB, I want the um, accordion. So I let's see what happens. I'm pretty sure you can do this. Um, but the, my, my point in doing this, even if it doesn't work, is to show you that in general, you can mix and match all these different, um, you can mix and match all these different tactics. Let me paste that in. Yeah. Oh, that's sick. I'm so relieved that that worked. Um, so the, hopefully you can see the advantage of like understanding this markdown. Even if you don't understand it, you can still wrangle it with this quick guide and get the examples and paste them in. Because doing this with the templates that come stock with Brightspace, you can do it. But it is not nearly as easy to do it as it is when you're just dealing with a little bit of markdown as opposed to a whole bunch of HTML. And by the way, also using those templates, if you get like six accordions and you want five or you want seven, you really have to kind of like fight with that HTML. So this is, I think, a little bit of a better way to do it. Any questions on um, it, the accordions or the tabs? I have a question about the accordions. Yeah. Um, it, do you have to paste as the whole page or can you paste a standalone HTML? Because when I do standalone HTML, it's not working. I Yeah, so the stand, I, yes, um, you're talking about like right here? Yeah, yeah. So what this selector is for, um, Brightspace has as a backbone um, bootstrap, which is a whole bunch of prepackaged JavaScript and CSS. And so... Mm -hmm this software is really meant to sit on top of the bootstrap technology, which um, Brightspace certainly didn't make it, but they leverage it. So, mm -hmm. um, so we use that. If you do standalone HTML, this is meant for like, if you were doing just a regular page, like an HTML page, not in, um, not necessarily within uh, Brightspace. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to figure out because our institution has a, a template that includes some information about the college at the bottom. And mm -hmm. so I don't want to make like a whole page, you know, from body to body yeah. with this. I just want to pull out the HTML that I need. And I'm having trouble with that where it just, it isn't working when I do that. So let me, um, how many tabs? Let me let me just walk this down to two tabs. Uh, actually, you know what? Uh, I'll start from scratch because I think I understand what you're asking. So I'm just going to copy that. And uh, were you talking about accordion or tabs? I'm sorry. Well, the one I really wanted was the accordion, but eventually okay. I'll want both. Yeah. So. If you, if you inspect this HTML, um, there's kind of three components. And you can modify 
it's probably the case. I actually don't know. Like, I'd have to look at your institution's um, content to see if they are making the calls to Bootstrap and to Cloudflare. Actually, if, is it in Brightspace or is it the actual website? It's in Brightspace. Okay. I'm looking and and I see the Bootstrap CSS under the, in the source code. Okay. So, and may, may, you know, I'd be happy to meet with you and kind of like go over it because it, it might take a little bit longer than I think it might to inspect this, the, what the existing infrastructure and what needs to be added. So, okay. That's um, fair. okay. So yeah, just uh, drop me a, an email and we'll, um, we'll get together on that. Okay. Uh, Aaron, we have until 145, correct? You are correct. Okay, and we'll leave a little bit of time for Q&A, I suppose, at the end. So I'm gonna show you call out boxes, which is one of my favorite things. And here's like an example of where you might want to- through with one super quick question. Yeah. Have you figured a way to get the accordions to have color in the um, in the accordion before it's dropped out? In Brightspace, they're usually, yeah, they're white right there. Have you ever figured out a way to make those color? Um, not, so, Yes, you can because uh, you can inspect the HTML and kind of like look at what that class is and you can add styles to it. So okay. um, let me see if I can do this. I would just do this like before I paste it in. I think it's And there nice. wasn't a pre-made one in the, um, in the software that you're using. No, okay. um, but the, the, that's a good feature request. I'm going to write that down. Uh, and on Monday, one thing that I did showcase, and I'm going to do just like the Jumbotron again, and I'm going to do um, heading one with some text as well as heading two with some text. Um, one of the things that you can do is use this selector, and we have like pre-made color schemes. So for instance, my Python class is always like Hunter Green and my ed tech class is always this like red berry color. And mm -hmm. so it changes both the, some of the heading texts as well as the Jumbotron. Um, so there, there certainly are ways that's very easy to do color and you can actually import your own color um, palette into here as well. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And in fact, I think it's under special decorator. Uh, yeah, it's this thing right here. So if you if you have say you want to make it like match the color of your institution and say the color of your institution is Dodger blue, which is one E nine zero FF, then you could just put this in here and it automatically will all the content will adhere to that. So that's something that you can do as well. Um, but I don't that's think it, yeah, I don't I don't think it does anything with them um, with the uh, accordions quite quite yet. But I put that on the feature request list. <laughs> Um, so the next thing that we're going to do, and I'm going to go back down to, I'm going to start from scratch again, uh, is, uh, what's known as a call out box. And that's what this box is right here. So in my Python class, I want my learners to like download a file, but in other classes, I use it like click here to some actually like submit your work. Um, and you can put all sorts of different icons down there. And call out boxes are actually really easy to do. It's just call out. You have whatever text you want, and then you call out end. Um, and then the only challenge is like if you want to have say like uh, an icon, you kind of have to know what they are. So I think it's like external alt link will give you. Oops. Will give you that icon. Um, I think like school is an icon, book is an icon. And so the question is like, well, how do you know what the icons are? And if you go to the quick guide, uh, let's see, it's under callouts, um, under callout icons, it gives you a list of some of them, but you can click on this link right here and any of these will work. So if, say you wanted to have a wrench, oh, I guess wrench is one. You can come back here. And in, instead of putting book, you can write wrench and you'll get an icon of a wrench. So this is basically like all a 1600 free icons that you can use from Font Awesome. Um, so you can kind of like pick whichever one you want and then uh, just write that in there. So like, uh, 
I, I think you get the point. I think there actually is a podcast one too. Sweet. So if you have, for instance, a podcast and a course and you want learners to listen to it, you can just put that in there. So that's called a call out box. And all it is, is you start with call out. If you want an icon, you put the icon name and then you just have to call out end. And again, like you can put, if you want, you could put an accordion here. You could put an accordion inside of a tab inside of an accordion in here. It's all about just like um, wrangling that markdown. Um, so that that's called a call out. And uh, actually, I might even have. Nah, that's all right. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot is like, why do I have my learners do the um, look at the submit their assignment somewhere else as opposed to just making this an assignment. And so this is, I'm gonna take a departure from this tool real quick, just to step on my soapbox. One of the problems I have with Brightspace is if you have a lot of content and some of these are quizzes or assignments, then it will like take up, you know, half a page. You have to scroll down until you get to the next assignment or the next item. But if you make all your item pages, like HTML pages or web pages, then you can link to the assignment from here. Um, and, and that's what my, that's what this link goes to. And that just keeps my list of things to do in the chapter very, very tidy because uh, it really sucks. Say if this is an assignment and this is an assignment, the one in the middle, if this is just a link, it might be very easy to scroll through it because you're scrolling down two or three windows to see this lab, this lab description. And then there's a little link and then a whole nother lab description. So I prefer to do it that way. And that's one of the reasons why I use the, um, the call outs quite a bit. I did not show you links. So I'm gonna show you a link right now. It's very, very simple. Say you wanted uh, a link to, uh, I don't know, SUNY's website. You have to put it in single brackets and then immediately afterwards, you just put the URL and that turns it into a link. Uh, and then this link, um, you know, I can open the link in a new tab or, or whatever. So to do any type of link whatsoever is just you put your what you want the text to be, in this case, SUNY, and then the URL uh, in the parentheses afterwards. Um, and, and that's actually pretty important for, for, for a lot of links uh, because, you know, the, the way the Internet works. Um, and I guess in the last few minutes, I'll show you. There is a way to do, um, let's see, you can do under media, I have the YouTube, um, you can do keyboard keys, which is really cool. So if you're, say you're teaching a uh, Photoshop class and the learners really need to know like what the key combinations are, I just copied and pasted the, a few different examples of it. This is how it renders. So it's, you just write triangle key and you have to, uh, bookend it with these asterisks otherwise uh, it doesn't really work um and you can put you can make up the keys it doesn't matter it's just the way it renders the text so it's not actually like it doesn't have to be a key that you find on your computer um so that that's a nice way you know if you want to teach your learners how to copy and paste for instance um and then i'll just leave you with this i'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of this sidebar that you can actually um reference an image from google drive actually i think i can do this one for you do I have my Google Drive images open? Uh, FLCC logo. If you have, say, like a PNG, let me just double, or a JPEG or a GIF or anything like that. Okay, so we have a uh, PNG here. If you right click on it, assuming it's shared so that anyone with the link can view it, then you can just copy the link. But I'm going to go into share just to make sure that it's, yep, anyone with the link can view it. You just copy the link. Uh, and I think I remember how to do this one. I don't think I'm going to need to look this up. It's very similar to the link. So this is where the alt text goes. And so we would say like the FLCC logo. And then you put the link, except you have to prepend it with Google Thumb. And then you'll get that rough. So this document is just a text document. I didn't have to embed any images. In fact, I didn't embed any images. I'm just referencing it right from Google Drive. And one of the thing, nice things that, about Google Drive, and a lot of people don't realize this, if I wanted to update this, this particular image, 
If you go to file um, information and manage versions, you can upload another version here and that doesn't change the URL or the file ID. So say FLCC changed and this happened in the, in, back in the day, it used to be CCFL. All you have to do is upload the new icon right here and you'll never need to ever change anything here because the file ID doesn't change if you do it with managing versions. And that's true for PDFs as well. So um, the, the, on, the only issue I know right now is that if you go to the quick guide and you do this images from Google Drive, if you copy this code for some reason, and I'm not gonna bore you with the details, it doesn't have Google dash thumb here, so it doesn't work. You have to actually add the thumb and I'll fix that when we're done here. But in general, I hope you can see kind of like the potency and how you can really um, add some, some graphic work with the columns and the accordions and you can maybe streamline it a little bit for your learners. And with that, I think I'm gonna stop sharing. Awesome, Dave. Thank you so much. Are there yeah, any yeah. kind of closeout questions for Dave before we go? I had a quick one. I was interrupted. It's like you were explaining what I consider the biggest weakness in Brightspace. And that is when you're in modules and you have assignments or discussions, the descriptions also go into the module. And like you said, you can have a huge um, two page description that makes the module uh, look really bad and there's yeah. no way to truncate that. Did I did I see that you have bypassed that by um, it, it looked to me like you had suggested that there was a way to bypass that. Yeah, you just make everything a page and then if it's an assignment, you link to it. So, for instance, um, this this is just, a, you know, when you create content, you create an HTML page or create a yep. web page. So I just put all the instructions there. And then when you need to link to the actual assignment, um, I usually do it down here, like in my call out box. So that's going to the assignment tool for the Dropbox for the assignment. Yeah. And it's a little wonky. You can't use this link button. You have to use this link button. Oh. And, and you can pick actually any content within um, Brightspace. So that's how I do it because otherwise it is just too overwhelming. That's a great idea that, yeah, that's been, I, I think that one of my top five complaints or weaknesses uh, is that huge, because everybody has a big, well, most people have big descriptions for their discussions and assignments. Yeah. And then that all gets put on that module page. And like you said, if you have a link in between two, a lot of times the students don't even see it. Yep. So, um, and I, I didn't say this earlier today. But there is a difference for rendering if you're using the description field in Brightspace or the web page file, um, because you can get more functionality if it's a web page versus a description. Because descriptions don't actually let you have JavaScript. So if you have an accordion in the in the description, it will get stripped out. Mm. Um, uh, they probably do that for some kind of security reason. Um, but that's why that's another reason why almost all my content is always a web page. And then if you actually click on the assignment, the call out still works. So if you were to click on any particular assignment, um, it would just have a, a box that says click here to see the description. Um, one of the other nice things is you can open up your, your assignment. So th the visibility of this and um, whether learners can access it or not is different than for the assignment. So you can have all this open on the first day of the semester, but if you don't want people submitting it, then you can hide all the assignments in the back end and the assignments um, screen oh that's a yeah that's a great point so it's like a placeholder in a sense yeah except they can see all they can see what the assignment is and if you right. don't want they just can't it. click into it to do it or to drop it into the dropbox that's that's another big interesting yeah. thing too yep Uh, can, can you repeat one one quick thing when you said you were linking that assignment? You said you need to use this link and not that link, which and you, you can use the words because I know them, but um, yeah, uh, I don't actually know the word. Um, so I am going to sh share it with you because, uh, so like if you were going, so I'll go back into this lab. Um, 
when you're, I, I think this is true and, and it's possible I lied, but like, let's say that I wanted this to link to the assignment. If you mm -hmm. hit this button, um, oh, I guess you can insert the quick link and you can do it that way as well. Um, okay. Whereas this button will automatically go to the quick link. All right. So it's a quick link and not an insert stuff. Got it. Okay. It's, yeah. Thank you for uh, keeping me honest. And actually, I'm glad to see this because I don't, if this has always been there, I've, I haven't seen it in the past. So I'm glad that it's there. Um, just know that you have to use this if you want to go to any internal thing in the course. Yeah, I think that's I new. I think and that, that might also, be new. Yeah, it is new. And it, it, it's it's also, that's one of my major issues with Brightspace is, is the assignments taking up like all of the screen real estate with all of the instructions. And stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, now, single I, biggest issue. I will tell you that the dark side of this is that if you make your content and then you, you know, like copy the HTML and paste it in here, you have to re-highlight this and you have to like relink it every time you dump HTML back into this screen. So if you make a change from semester to semester um, and you're using this tool to do it, you have to remember that you have to make this and in, in, in insert the quick link. But it's not that big of a deal. The learners are very good about telling me when I screwed up. Oh, so when you do a course copy, it doesn't necessarily... Nope. Course, course copies do work. It's okay. just like if you are working on and actually I, I, I can show you this because I, I didn't show this on Monday. And Aaron, you can make us shut up whenever you want. Uh, I know I'm taking up You're a okay. lot of time. Um, I did. This is something like if you copy the HTML, if you've used this software to create it, if you paste the HTML in, it will reverse engineer into just the markdown to an extent. Um, if you get fancy like I do, then like it, it, um, it will have, it will sc screw up a little bit. But, um, my point in telling you all of this is that, yeah. So like, if I were to take this and now like make some change, like maybe I want to make, make it say like twine games or something like that. So I made a change and I copy this and then I dump the HTML into here. I'd have to go down and go back down to that wherever that link was and and um change it okay or re re remake it but semester to semester and course dumps works fine any other questions Now I'm over here redoing my whole next week. And it looks so much better. So Aaron, can I steal like another 45 seconds? Oh yeah, of course. This was shown to me by uh, Carrie, uh, who's a faculty. She's actually the department chair. She used this tool, the user links, which is not in the default template, at least at FLCC. And if you use the user links, all these are kind of like the central nervous system that we used to have a separate place in Blackboard where you could have like kind of two content areas, but you only get one in Brightspace. So all of these are things that learners in the class are going to need frequently, or at least when they want it, they want to be able to find it a hunt, like very quickly. So this is like a, an ode to the study that Alexander showed. Um, but th these are just internal links to documents that I have in my course welcome. So like right here. So now if I need to change the due dates, I just change it here in this one spot. And it automatically is changed. Like, cause when the learner clicks on here, it goes to where I just showed you, it goes to that due date. So we've been using, or at least I have been using this court, this user links um, widget as a really slick way to give kind of like quick access to things that learners in the class need to know. Another oh. freebie from Dave. Yeah, that, that one doesn't cost you a dime. <laughs> hey Dave, speaking of freebies, how did you get your, is that a GIF file that's doing the welcome in your yeah. module? Yeah, you can, um, you can put uh, GIF files right in the, in, in the, so we'll, the, if you don't specify an image for a module, you know this, it will just like steal the course banner. Yeah. yeah. But the very first image that you put in your content is what gets used for that. And so actually Aaron showed me this trick years and years and years ago. I, if you were to click in that module, you would not see the GIF you'd see other images because I just made the width zero and the height zero. Erin showed me that she does that in WordPress all the time. And then, so the thumbnail is that, but when you click in, you don't have that annoying GIF. That would be really, really big. You can't even see it. Okay. I was just, I remember trying to use uh, 
gifts earlier and that they never would would go like the motion wouldn't work it was a static picture for us um so i didn't know if there was a trick i haven't tried it in two years but yeah, I, give it a whirl. just remember two years ago we had people putting uh gift files in for the descriptions and they just were static and when i saw yours moving i thought hmm, that's <laughs> we, we couldn't do that um yeah well it, it, at least it works at flcc yeah, <laughs> but I suspect I suspect it'll work anywhere. We're actually having horrible troubles with our um, uh, thumbnails and and f files. Just in the last two months, where you almost have to clear cache every day, otherwise the images are sticking on us. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I, I Somebody can't... suggested that Chrome might have done an advanced tracking uh, thing, and if you don't turn it off, it it fills up your cash more um, <laughs> is the most recent thing we've heard. But yeah, we, I used to train daily and would show people all kinds of image changes. And in the last two months, I have to clear cash almost every time to get image changes to show up in Brightspace. I mean, th that seems like an easy thing to troubleshoot. Just do it at a different institution. And if it doesn't, if it works well in one and not in Alfred's, then it's a <laughs> configuration there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for letting me go nine minutes over, everybody. I appreciate you coming and spending your Thursday afternoon here. Uh, and Aaron did put my email in the um, chat, so I'm always happy to bounce ideas off and uh, meet with you. Thanks so much, Great. Dave. Great um, really, really appreciate you sharing your expertise with our community of practice. And thanks to everyone who attended for your attention and participation. The full schedule of sessions for National Distance Learning Week can be found at the first link, and the recordings are going to be posted there as well throughout the week. And National Distance Learning Week is sponsored by the U.S. Distance Learning Association, so we invite you to check out their website for other events that are happening this week from other institutions around the country. It's a really awesome um, event happening now all over, so check it out. And again, thanks so much, Dave. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the week.